just why something exists, why the church is here, why Red Oak is here, why we exist. And so the church's purpose is the reason why the church exists. Now, the purpose can be divided into two categories. The first category is the internal purpose, and that's, that's found in Acts chapter 2. Once again, all these verses on the back of your handouts if you got one. If not, they can be found on our website. But the, the outline and then the, the verses are on the handout. But the first, the internal purpose, look with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 40. So with many other words did he testify uh, and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this untoward generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many uh, wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, had all things in common. They sold their possession and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And this passage has become known really as the marching orders of the early church. What they were doing. Why they were doing it. Acts, the whole book, if we remember, is an account of the early church. Basically their first business meeting. Their, uh, the things that they were doing day in and day out. Their beginning of mission work and evangelism is all encapsulated in the book of Acts. And so to recap what we've talked about the past few weeks, how does one join the church? We'll back up to Acts 2, 41. What's it say? Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And so Peter has been preaching a sermon, one of the, the earliest sermons in church history. He is preaching this sermon, and he has used Old Testament examples of, of who Jesus was and how Jesus was the Messiah and what they needed to do. And when he got to the invitation, they said, men, what do we have to do? And this is what Peter tells them in verse 40, uh, 41, or verse, uh, verse 38, actually. He tells them to repent. He tells them to be baptized. He tells them to turn from their sin, believe in Jesus, be baptized because they've been saved, and then they're added. And that's exactly what they do in verse 41 there on your paper. What does it say? They gladly received his word. And then in turn, linked directly, they were baptized. And when those two things happened, they were added to the church. So how do you join the church? Well, you're saved, and then you identify with Jesus. You, you demonstrate the outward, or you demonstrate outwardly the inward change that happened within you. You be baptized, you join the church, and then there are things next in the next six verses that describe things that the church is to do. There are several of them. Talk about communion prayer, but there's three that I want to highlight. And the first one is found in verse 42. It says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now the meaning of that phrase, they continued steadfastly, those believers stubbornly persisted. Know anybody like that? They stubbornly persist. They basically reject anything you had to say. They're stubborn in their persistence. That's what they were doing. They were stubbornly persistent. They were continuing daily in the apostles' doctrine. And so what that means, basically, they were listening to the apostles. They were hearing the apostles. They were breaking down what the apostles said. They were referring back to the Old Testament and studying. They were, they were hearing it. They were taking it in, chewing on it, and filing it away. So the first purpose of the church is to teach the word. We should be stubbornly persistent in our teaching of the Word of God. It is not my job to get up here with a world magazine and to preach and to teach on things happening in the world or current events or man-made opinion. This is what we talk about. Amen. This is what we teach. This is our textbook. It irritated the fire out of me. When you go to a class and you're spending thousands of dollars for this college class, and he'd turn around and spend a hundred or so dollars on a textbook. And as you got further and further along in your program, the textbooks got more and more and more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so then you get to a class and you spent, you know, a couple hundred dollars on several textbooks and you never used them. Amen. 
I got the right means on that, and I told them how I'm preaching. <laughs> so irritating. And then you can't sell them back. They won't give you a fraction of what you paid for them. So then they just collect dust. Very nice investment, isn't it? Off of that pretty piece of paper. We come to church, this is our only textbook. Amen. That's right. And we should use it. Amen. Every time we come in here. We don't teach and preach opinion. We teach and preach the word. That's right. The apostles' doctrine. These are the things that Peter and Paul had to say. Now, who were they talking about? What words were they saying? They were the words of Jesus. Read what Paul has to write to his churches all throughout the New Testament. And who is he, who is he spewing out? Jesus. It's Jesus. What does he tell the church? I received from who? Jesus. Peter, what, remember how Jesus said. Remember how Jesus did. This is our textbook. And so above all, we are to teach the word. He says they continued steadfastly. They anchored themselves in this Bible. And I want to be very careful. A lot of people will say we teach Bible doctrine or Baptist doctrines. We have to be careful when you teach Baptist doctrines. You have to be very careful when you teach Calvinistic doctrines. Very careful when you teach Methodist or Pentecostal doctrines. Because I don't want to teach Baptist doctrines. I don't. I want to teach Bible doctrines. And if the Baptist doctrine is not lined up with the Bible doctrine, then which one is wrong? The Baptist doctrine. And so we need to make sure that Jesus had, there was a time when Jesus was talking to people and he told them, he says, you have traded the words and the commandments of God for what? The traditions of men. Everything we fall back to comes from the word of God. It can, if it can't be backed up from the word of God, we best not be teaching it. Amen. Amen. If it can't be backed up from, God, from God's word, we better not be believing it, and we sure better not be preaching it. The first purpose of the church is to teach the Bible, is to teach the word. And here's why. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us why we teach this word specifically. Ephesians 4, 12 through 16 reads this. It says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the sons of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here's why. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. From who the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, the primary reason we teach the word is so that you can be anchored. God, I don't know if you know, but we live in a dangerous, dark world. Amen. And social media, I, I enjoy social media. Uh, I do. I think it can do wonders. I think it's very useful. I also think it needs to be understood, and it does not need to be underestimated. In that, it's pretty dangerous. Now, I, I follow a lot. I follow on YouTube. I follow a lot of churches, a lot, a lot of preachers that I listen to and I watch. There's a lot of them I don't. Now, why don't I? Because they don't teach the truth. That's right. I, every preacher I listen to, what am I doing? I'm testing them. I'm verifying that what they're saying is right. And a lot of the, the, the preachers you hear aren't preaching the truth. They have their own spin on it. They have their own opinion on it. They don't teach the Bible. They teach whatever they want. And TikTok, I've got on TikTok, I am on TikTok, and I follow a lot of them. And there are a lot of Bible scholars on there. There really are. If you find them, there's some really smart people on there. There's a lot of them that aren't. And if we are not actively in the Word of God, you'll never know. If your children are not actively taught the Word of God, if your grandchildren are not actively taught what is contained in the pages of Scripture, they hear these things on their social media devices and they believe them. You know what's dangerous in a little 8-year-old or a 12-year-old believing the things they hear on TikTok or any social media? A 40-year-old who's been in church all their life, or a 60-year-old who's been in church all their life, who still doesn't know the doctrine. <laughs> They are just like that child. Only the child hasn't been taught yet. That's what Ephesians is saying. He, the, the hope is when we teach the word that when we leave here, when you leave Sunday school, when you leave preaching, when you leave
leave Bible study, that you're not leaving as a child who still doesn't know the scriptures. Any of y'all's children still uh, know that the tooth fairy is real? Santa Claus is real, the Easter Bunny is real. Absolutely, there's children out there. Now, what do children, what are they known for? Believers are told to have this, it's childlike faith, right? The faith of a child, they'll believe anything you tell them. Oh, and it's going to be okay, right? They believe these things. Well, a child is known to believe the things that aren't necessarily true. And for believers, we need to be anchored in the Word of God and understand the Word of God so that we are not like a child who believes everything they hear. Who hears uh, that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, we believe it. In order that we are the church, and you don't have to go to church, you can just be the church wherever you are. These are false doctrines. And if you are not actively in the Word of God, then you don't know the difference. And so in order for us to be anchored, we have to understand this is the truth. Not subjective, objective. This is the truth. And so the church is to teach the word. The second thing we are to do goes back to verse 47. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The second thing the church is to do is to worship. That's why we do this, right? That's why we come in on Sunday mornings, even in the rain, the wet, the heat. We come in to do one thing. That's to worship. To worship the Lord. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21 says, To him be glory in the church. We come in and what do we do? We honor him. We glorify him. We, we, we think about all the things he's done. The great price he's paid for salvation. The blessings he bestows on upon all of us. We come in here, we sing songs lifting up the name of Jesus. We worship him. The psalmist writes in Psalm 95, 6, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. We come in here and we humble ourselves. We say, Lord, I'm not worthy. You are. Lord, I don't deserve it, but you gave it anyways. And we worship him because of his goodness, because of his grace. We praise him. And then the third purpose is also found in verse 47, but back up to verse 45. Actually, we'll go ahead and back up to verse 44 and see what they were doing. And all that believed were together. And they had all things in common. Verse 45. They sold their possessions and goods. And what they do? They divided them among all as anyone had need. Mm -hmm. Guys, they went out to their storage shed. Saw what they had extra of that they didn't necessarily need or they weren't ever going to use. And they got rid of it. <coughs> they donated some wood. They donated some tools. They sold some things. And they gave to people who didn't have things. If someone was in need... They sacrificed. They gave up something that they maybe didn't need or haven't used in a long time or women maybe they, the men hadn't used in three years or so. You know that, that thing that's just sitting in the garage. They haven't touched it since they got it, but they still need it. They sold it. They got rid of it. They parted it out. Why? Because their brothers and sisters were in trouble. And so they, they uh, basically they served those people that were around them. They sacrificed and they gave of themselves and the things they owned so that they could help their brothers and sisters in trouble. But if you also look down to verse 47, the Bible says that they were having favor with all the people. I really believe what this entails and encompasses is that they were doing things among people around them. In order to have favor, people have to think highly of you, and there has to be some reason that they think highly of you. I'm sure they were doing stuff that pleased the people around them. Maybe they were sharing meals. Maybe they were sharing food. Maybe they were sharing prayer. Maybe they were sharing the money from the things that they were pouring out and giving in verse 45. They were doing things to serve the people around them. Our church, while we are here to teach the word, while we are here to worship, one of the major things we are here to do is serve our community. Famous words of Jesus. He said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. The disciples... First is last, the last is first. You are to be a servant. The church is to be a servant. Think about our fireworks show Monday. Was it fun? Absolutely. Was it well done? Yes, I think it was one of the best fireworks shows I have ever been to. No amens? Okay, sorry, Lloyd. <laughs> I think it was one of the better ones, but, uh, you know. Amen. Thank you, sir. <laughs> if you don't know, it lasted 20, 25 minutes or so. It was a long fireworks show. Barely any gaps in there. Lloyd did a great job. 
Very well done. And the 14 guys lighting and the firefighters staying and stand by just in case. Great job. Did we do it just to have a good time and blow things up? Well, yeah. Was that the only reason we did it? No. We had several people come up to us and, and, and thank us for, for doing it because we, pro we were providing an event that was safe for their family. They didn't have to worry about their kids running around or worry about what their kids were going to come into contact with. We were a safe environment. They really don't know how safe because we took a lot of precautions to make sure everyone was taken care of. But we were providing a safe environment to celebrate our country and the freedoms we so are entitled to and that we, we appreciate. It was to serve our community. We didn't charge for the ice cream. We didn't charge admission. We didn't pay 20 bucks for parking. We didn't do any of that. Why? Because we were here to serve. And if you saw the turnout, we had a great turnout. They were so appreciative, so thankful for everything we did. The church is here to worship the Lord. Absolutely. The church is here to, to teach the word. But the church is here to do works of service. Where we tell Red Oak, we care about you. We're here for you. We want to serve you. Not, not necessarily because we necessarily want to. But because Jesus demonstrated an active service. And so as his church, we too serve other people. But that second thing leads us to the second purpose. And this is the external purpose. We can also describe this as our mission, the thing we do outside. So inside the church, what do we do? We worship the Lord, we teach the word, and we serve. Outside of that, the external purposes that we have are found in Matthew chapter 28. We all know these by heart, but if you want to turn there, you're more than welcome to. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. But before we get there, we need to understand the primary purpose of a Christian, of a believer, is to follow Christ. And I think I would argue that you cannot actually be a Christian if you do not follow Christ. To be a Christian means someone who has, has altered their behavior, their heart, their mind in such a way that you are reflecting Christ. You are following Christ in every aspect of your life. And so the Bible speaks of the following, says the following of those people who follow Christ. First off in 1 Peter 2.21. He says, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Matthew 6, 13, this is the model prayer. The prayer goes, do not lead us into temptation. The concept there, Jesus is leading us and we are following. Psalm 23, 1 through 2, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me a lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. John 10, 3 through 4. To him the doorkeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings his own sheep out, what do they do? He goes before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. The Bible is clear. Jesus is leading through the Holy Spirit. He is leading. It's our job as believers, as children of God, to follow and so, in order to, to, to be external, you have first have to follow Christ, but then second, what we have to do is found in Matthew chapter 28. It says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So the second, the external purpose. Once you follow Christ, the external purpose becomes for the church to make disciples. Now that, that word go there, it implies that you are already going. You're already having wins. You're already going. That's not the command. The command is found later on in the verse, and it says to make disciples. That's the external purpose purpose that we are here to do. We are to make disciples. Now the question arises, who either are these disciples or who can be these disciples? But the Bible clarifies that. The Bible says that we are to make disciples of all nations. Discipleship from the church should not be a limiting field uh, of study, basically. It shouldn't have a limit on it. You know, you go to a roller coaster and what happens? You maybe have to be this tall to ride. That's not a discipleship. We don't get to filter who can and can't be a disciple. If they follow Christ, if they're baptized, 
then they are eligible to become a disciple of Christ. And I would argue they've already started the process. And so if we are told that we are to make disciples of all nations, that incorporates all people. If Christ died for everyone, then there's our target audience, that we are to reach everyone. Now, we can do that at Red Oak, right? We can go to Dollar General, and we can see the people there. We can go into the storage unit or to the charging station, to the filling station, all these things. We can go to these places, and we can see people. We can interact with them and possibly win them and bring them to church, right? We can do that. But what about China? Let's move closer. What about the Philippines? How do we do that? How do we reach Texas? How do we reach Mexico? How do we reach these other nations all across the globe? Where well, these things called associations and partnerships. Where local churches come together and say, look, we can't send all of our members to China or to the Philippines to plant a church. But what we can do is take up a collection and use that money to support people and send them to the Philippines so that they can plant a church. And so we do not limit and say, well, we can't do it, so we won't do it. No, here's the mission. The mission is to reach people. We have to figure out how do we do this. We can't say, no, I can't do it. How do we do it? Who do we send? How do we support them? We have to be making disciples, and those disciples are all, all nations. Limitless, boundless, target for the church, same people, everyone. And so how are they made? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the same way way that those people were made to join the church. <coughs> Acts 2.41, what happens? Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. There are two ways we make disciples. The first one is through baptism or evangelism. Now, in the Bible, we talk about it in Sunday school. In the Bible, when you see baptism, it's always closely linked to salvation. Always. Talked about it last week. You never see someone waiting time and time and time and time down the road. It's always baptized, uh, saved and baptized. These 3,000 people that were added to the church this day, they heard Peter's words. They received them. They believed them. They repented. They turned and placed their faith and their trust in Jesus, and they were baptized. Peter told them in Acts 2.38, that you're baptized for because you're a mission of sins. And so the first way that people are made disciples is by baptism. That is through evangelism. That's the first part of the Great Commission. You teach them, you baptize them, and you teach them to observe. So the first way we make disciples is through baptism. The equivalent would be evangelism. And so we talk about evangelism. Evangelism is deliberately going on the offensive, trying to win people into the kingdom of God, trying to go into battle with your sword, your knowledge of the, of the word, maybe your knowledge of other religions and all these things, and you try to convert that person into a relationship with Jesus. Not forcefully, lovingly. It's because in light of all, that, all my sin, and yet Jesus saved me, I want that same thing to happen to the next person. And so out of appreciation for Jesus, we go on the offensive to those who we love and those who we encounter. And we try to win them into a relationship with Jesus. That's evangelism. And studies show that most churches are no longer doing evangelism. I want to talk about this. Years ago, there was a paradigm around the church, and the idea of the church was to come and see we're expecting you to visit. Maybe think about that for just you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. The idea of the church, the, the, the paradigm of the church was to come and see. They were expecting you to be there, right? You were expected to go to church. You were expected not to play sports on Sunday or Wednesday nights. You were expected. Church was a major anchor of the society and of the, of the community. You were expected to come. Well, the paradigm has shifted. Now the church has to go and invite. There's something you need to see. There's good news you need to hear. That's the new paradigm. And so studies have shown, back dating probably 50 years, that evangelism has really diminished in the church. We're no longer evangelizing. And why? Well, there's a lot of fears. There's a lot of uh, reasons why. The fear of failure. The fear of rejection. The fear of torn relationship. All these fears. And so the church says it's easier not to evangelize. But the only way the church is to grow is through evangelism. That we are going and we are leading people into being saved. We're teaching them that you need to now be baptized. And I want to be very clear here. 
I do not care about building the number of this church. Okay? What do you mean? I don't want to be numbers driven. I don't care that our church roll is 400 or 4,000. I don't care. That's not the goal. Several weeks ago, we had visitors here. I told them to go visit other churches. I did a little couple counseling a couple weeks ago. I told them, y'all need to find a church you need to go to. Which one? That's between you and God. I don't know. If it's Red Oak, fantastic. If it's not, I understand. I don't want you here if God doesn't want you here. If God wants you here, praise the Lord. Hey, we have a teaching position open for you. You're welcome to step into it, right? We have fireworks show. You're welcome to hand out popsicles. You're, you're welcome to get involved and be active. If this is a church you feel like you're led to be at. But if you're not, that's no big deal to you. Go and follow the Lord. I don't want us to be so focused on getting people in the door and counting our numbers. And don't focus on counting the numbers of our people here. Focus on how many people have been saved through our church. Focus on how many people have been baptized through our church. These are the metrics that matter. People work on Sundays. People move. But Jesus changes lives. Don't focus on, on the numbers that come in here. Focus on lives that are changed by the message of the gospel. That's what we should be focused on. You start looking around and say, well, we're a small church. That doesn't matter. We serve a big God. That's right. And he can do all kinds of things. Amen. When we focus on the right things. Amen. And the right thing is not to have 100, 200, 3,000 people here. The goal is to see lives change with the message of the gospel. We build heaven by building the church. Don't care about numbers. We care about souls. Seeing souls saved, souls baptized, and souls entering the kingdom of God because they heard the message of the gospel through Red Oak Missionary Baptist Church. That's the goal. Okay, so don't ever think that I want to build 4,000 members here. I can't imagine pastoring 4,000 people. But if we can win 4,000 souls into the kingdom of God, praise the Lord, hallelujah. So you, you grow disciples, you, you train disciples first by evangelizing, bringing them into a relationship with Jesus. The second way is by teaching. That's what the Great Commission says, right? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And so we teach them this would be discipleship. Interestingly, paired with evangelism, churches have neglected evangelism. They've also neglected the discipleship. Discipleship program used to be you come to Sunday school, right? You come to preaching. And then you go home and your parents might do some Bible studies. You might read at the house and things like that. They won't do that anymore. And so in order for us to disciple, the church has to get very laser focused on meaningful discipleship. Meaning classes that lead people into a deeper understanding and a deeper relationship with Jesus. It means teaching uh, not necessarily content. Right? I can tell you all the Old Testament stories. Right? Daniel and the lion's den, Noah's ark. It's not about teaching content necessarily. It's about teaching behavior. Yes. It's about teaching to observe <clears throat> all things that I have commanded. Jesus didn't say, I, I need you to know everything that I told you. He says, I need you to live out, to observe, to alter your behavior in regard to what I told you. We teach them to observe all things. And so by fulfilling the teaching portion of the, of the Great Commission, we take believers at every stage of spiritual maturity to the next stage of growth. We take the babes in Christ to carnal. We take the carnal babes in Christ <coughs> to spiritual giants. We lead them through teaching of the word of God, through discipleship, through a relationship with other people. I've heard of churches that have a disciple cycle. I think it'd be great eventually to have. But you see people who, first off, you have a middle person. So put you in the middle, okay? And then you have a mentor, someone who's discipling you. And then under you, you have a mentee. You have someone who you're discipling. And it's a disciple cycle. We see this all throughout the Bible. Paul had Timothy. He had Titus. He had people who he was discipling. You, you see this with the, uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. They were living in the community. They were going house to house, and they were talking about the scriptures. They were living this together. It was an idea of community. And so what's the purpose of the church? All right? What's the purpose of Red Oak? Well, here it is, and it's on your, your, your page. Here is our mission. Here is our purpose. It is to be disciple-making followers of Jesus that impact the Red Oak community of Hot Springs, Arkansas through worship, the word, and works of service. Everything we do as a church, 
this should be our filter. Are we making disciples? Are we impacting the community? Are we worshiping? Are we teaching the word? And are we serving? These are the things that the church should be focused on. That we are following Jesus above all. We're following Christ. And that we are making disciples. Everything we do here, every ministry we have, every Bible study we have, this should be the framework. That we strive to follow Jesus. And that we too make disciples that also in turn follow Jesus. And so I pray that Red Oak, that this is our driving and This is the purpose. This is the reason we continue. This is the reason we continue to have Bible studies. We continue to serve. It's so that we can follow Christ as we make people to also follow Christ. So let's bow in prayer and move into an invitation. Father, as we discuss the purpose of the church, we pray as a church here united. That we can come along and, and fulfill scripture, Father, be obedient to the Bible. As we strive to follow you, as the Bible says we should do as sheep, that we should follow our shepherd. And as we should follow you, for you are leading us in the path of righteousness and the way that we are to go. Father, allow us first and foremost to follow after you as a church body and as individuals. Who seek to give over control and to give you control by the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us as you would have us to go. And Father, allow this church to begin to make disciples, that we evangelize Red Oak, that we meet other people, and as we engage with other people, Father, we bring them into relationship with Jesus through the blood of Christ and out of the love and grace he has shown for us and for them. And Father, once we evangelize, once we get them saved, Father, it does not end there. We teach them the things that you've taught us. Teach them to observe the things in which you've commanded us to observe. Father, we pray that we can grow to disciples that would also impact Red Oak, Lord. May we be found faithful. May we be found obedient. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us as church members today, that we too would join together for the purpose of building the kingdom. That, Father, we may eventually, whenever you come back to get us, have fellowship with you forever and with the brothers and sisters who also have come to a relationship with Jesus. We pray, Father, that there's someone here who's never placed their faith and their trust in Jesus, Lord. There's no other way that salvation can come other than the blood of Jesus. So, Father, convict us during this invitation. Allow us to respond accordingly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please?